For the first time. Lots of hope response. Yeah, so is that because of the topic or is it just because this is the first time you've heard? <coughs> Both? Okay, you can tell because we're kind of screwing around here and putting up extra chairs and, and making room for everybody. But it's great to see you all. And those who are here coming back for the second or third or fourth or even the sixth, uh, welcome back. Yeah. So for those who don't know me, my name is Marion Ward and I'm a real estate broker here in Burlington. I'm also what's called a Lifestyle 55 Master and Senior Real Estate Specialist. That's just a bunch of, you know, bunch of words and titles, but really what it is is that I specialize in labor and life blues and estate sales. And I help to uh, folks like you um, navigate the maze of legal, financial, emotional, and any other thing that goes along with the labor and life blues and estate. I, uh, together with our educational partners, we realize that there's tremendous need in our community for older adults to get information for the topics that we've been covering. And we're grateful to see a full we're grateful to see a full room of people, but at the same time, it's kind of a sad thing that we that we have such a void of information. But we're here to solve that problem, and together with our educational partners. We'd love to help. So just if you haven't had a chance yet just to meet or speak with our educational partners, we've got them along the side. We have Sarah Sonnex from Smith's Funeral Homes, Angela Kelly from the States of Niagara, Jeanette Mock, Senior Fluid Transitions, Denise LeBlanc, she's yes, there, <laughs> Arbor Memorial, and Denise, uh, sorry, Irene Zoba from 360 uh, Downsizing. Not here today are Neela White from um, Brandon James and Jared Sia of Burlington Quality Care, and also Paul Cutajar from Senior Care Access. These folks are helping to fund this event, and but more importantly, they are people that I would go to with my own person, with my own business. They're all compassionate, caring. They're very much in the senior space, and people that you can rely on. So take advantage of, the, of them being here. They have information, promotional information. They're not here to sell you anything. But they, and they don't bite, so take advantage of that opportunity to get to know them. Also, or you can't forget, we've got uh, Lisa Gillido sitting there. She's Lisa and Ida. Ida's going to kind of put up some extra chairs there. My right hand women, right and left hand together with them. I mean, it would be possible. You can see how busy they've been today getting us going here. But before we get started, I'm just going to ask you a few things, or just ask you a few things. Um, first, please turn off your phones. It's, uh, you can see we've got a full room, and if there's a little bit tight on time, so then you just want to minimize those disruptions. As we get into the presentation today, I'm just going to ask that you hold your questions. Uh, Christine will stop midway and answer them. You have some notepads where you can jot down any notes to remind you what you'd like to ask. And the pens, if we've got these pens, there's a trick. If you take the top of the pen off, and on the tip of the pen, there's a little wee red knob, or a real, little wee red tip. You have to just kind of take that tip off, because otherwise they don't work. So just, they don't want to hear the pens don't work. They do. And when we get to the question and answer part of this session, I just ask that you please speak up so that everyone can hear you. And then also, just before we get going, um, in our October session, we had Jeanette Bach speaking about the 10 top, top 10 topics to discuss with your family. And we had a bunch of other conversations happening, and they came away with a little bit of confusion or overlap or some questions arose after that after that session. I'd just like to address them now so we have some clarity. Our goal here is that people come away with reliable, clear, concise information and not to confuse you further. So if there was any confusion at all, we apologize for that, but we sort of want to clarify that. So one of the things that came up in conversation last month was, can you avoid probate? And the answer is yes. There's different ways. You can do it through joint ownership, you can do it through insurance products, and you can do it through different types of trusts. We'll leave it at that for now. Um, advanced care plans. So if we spoke at um, one of the sessions around advanced care plans and power of attorney. So they are different. 
An advanced care plan is not a legal document where a power of attorney is. Um, there was a question arose about why pre-planning a funeral. So one of the answers that you should be going away with is that you, when you pre-plan your funeral and you purchase it today, you're purchasing in today's dollars and hopefully you're not using that for years to come and good chances the cost will be inflated at the time it's put to use. And then lastly, the probate tax. So there's no probate for estates with assets up to including $50,000 and for estates more than $50,000 the tax is charged at 1.5%. So I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm a realtor. So you could also refer to the video from the very first session, which was in June, where Andrew Cogman talked about a real estate law, estate law, and taxes, and the disposition on death. And then the July session, Neela White, who's not here today, she spoke about the silent worry and um, being financially prepared for aging. So both of those series go into those topics in detail. So if you have any further questions, you can look at that. But also, we also want to stress that there's no one size fits all answer for everybody. So in your personal circumstances, it's best to speak with your lawyer, your accountant, your financial advisor, and any of the other professional advisors. Okay? So Today we're turning our, our focus to tax credits and specifically those related to disabilities. The criteria has been updated recently and there may be some opportunities that we're not aware of. So our topic is unlocking the doors to the benefits you didn't know you had. And we're very fortunate to have Christine Brunston from Provide Home as our presenter today. So Christine's bio reads. Christine Brunston has been at the forefront of care planning and family support issues for more than 25 years. A visionary innovator, she took her own caregiving experiences and created a platform to ensure that people in her position were never without the resources she herself needed. She's the founder of Provide Calm, an enterprise that helps caregivers navigate confusion and chaos and helps families live their best life. So I have to say, because I know Christine, that her bio is pretty modest. She's an exceptionally fun, accomplished in several fields and is much like the Energizer Buzzy. If you've ever seen one, that's her. <laughs> when, when it comes to ideas and implementation, there's never a dull moment in your life. So help, please help me welcome Christine. Thank you, Marion. What I don't put in this bio is that I have five disabled family members. I have a mother in a wheelchair as a result of catastrophic injuries in a car accident, I have a father with dementia, I have children and their partners with disabilities, and I have two disabled grandchildren. I also look after a number of aging clients. So this is very near and dear to my heart, and I thank you all for coming today. My gratitude around this is, is extreme because you could spend your time anywhere, but you chose to come here with me. So I appreciate the time and I want to get going. And I want to be able to impart the information that you need to have, but then to be able to answer whatever questions that you might have as well. So I want to make sure that if there are any questions, if you feel uncomfortable asking those questions in a group, I'm going to hang around a little bit afterwards too, so you can always ask me questions in private. But let's get on your way. There's always has to be a disclaimer. The opinions in this presentation are my own. I have two companies around this. One is Provide Calm, the other one is called uh, Benefits 2. And we really came to Benefits 2 because of what the problems were that we were seeing in the industry. So we'll carry on from that as a short disclaimer, kind of. I'm gonna ask a question. What is the first thing that comes to mind when I say the word disability? And just shout your answers out of me. Okay. I heard wheelchair, I heard walking. Challenges. Challenges. Hearing. 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 Blindness. So we're hitting some of these. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly what I hear when I say the word disability is this year, wheelchair. Sometimes prosthetics, but usually a physical disability. And a lot of people don't realize that physical disabilities are only one 
of the disabilities that are out there, and when we talk about the criteria of what's included for this particular credit, it's really wide. So we'll move on to the next slide, because some disabilities do look like this, but others look like this. Has anybody done a quick count in the room? People? Can you do the math on 25% of that for me? <laughs> 15? Okay, so in a room of this size, given the statistics that we know about disabilities in Canada today, it really means that about 15 of us have a disability. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hands. I will raise my hand and say, I have a disability. Can you tell? Yeah. Right, and this is, this is the, the majority of the case are people that have invisible disabilities. You have no idea. We don't walk around with something on our forehead saying, I have ADHD. You have incontinence. You can't hear. We don't walk around with these labels at all. And many of these disabilities are invisible. We have no idea. So we all have to be cognizant as we're going around day to day that people might have challenges. They might, be, they might have an impairment. And I want to change the language of disability because I think that this credit gets a bad rap because of the D word. And it really just means I have an impairment which is preventing me from performing an activity of everyday life at the same pace and with the same uh, uh, vigor as someone else my age with no impairment. We talk about walking, and we'll get to that one later. It's always, somebody takes longer. Someone can't do it as long as someone else, or they, they can't do it at all. And that's the premise behind all of these impairments. So, next slide. I already told you. Do you guys remember what I said, what the percentage of population was that has a disability? 25. I rounded up. It's, it's actually 22. It's 20, I say 25. But I'll, I'll tell you, the reason I say 25 is because the stats that we have are a little bit outdated. Mm -hmm. So the last stats we have are from 2017, and we, our population is aging. And uh, the next stat will tell you why uh, we need to think about this credit and people who are over 55 more than people who are younger. So the percentage of Canadians over the age of 55 that hold this credit today, can I want to take a wild guess at what that percentage might be? 50. It's bigger than 15, or bigger than 22, bigger than 25. 50. 50. A little bit, a little bit, look. 70? 60. 60. Wow. Okay. So you can see why this credit is hugely important for anybody over 55 to understand and learn about and know that it exists. One of the biggest factors going forward as we talk about this credit is going to be dementia. The numbers on, on dementia worldwide, 55 million people worldwide have dementia today. In terms of size, that is bigger than Canada. In the terms of what is spent, it is bigger than any company you can imagine. Google, Amazon, Walmart, any company like that, the amount of spending spent on dementia is bigger than any company out there. Um, and we're not going the right way. All right, next slide. This is another big factor. Hmm. Currently, one in four people in Canada is a caregiver. They probably don't identify as being a caregiver. They're just supporting someone they love. They don't call it caregiving. We just call it, I'm, I'm helping someone. I'm supporting someone in my family. Soon this number is gonna be one and two. I think Rosalind Carter said at the best, there's only four different types of caregivers, but, um, and I don't remember the exact wording of her saying, but it just basically says that we are all gonna be a caregiver. Whether you're caring for somebody else or you're caring, you're caregiving for yourself, we will all be a caregiver at some point. Next slide. In Alberta, um, and this is the last that I could find, really between uh, 2010 and 2022, the number of caregivers in distress 
rose from 10 to 44 percent. And that's just between 2010 and 2022. And that has implica impl uh, implications on this credit as well, because now we've got caregivers in distress who are also acquiring disabilities. So when I said the last stats we had from 2017, they did do a new study. 2022, they did a new study through census. Uh, however, the results of that study, it takes them a long time to publish, won't be available till winter of 2023-2024. Okay. What we're all here to hear about today is the disability tax credit. This thing is this thing is so unknown. And I, I would presume that the way I think about the reasons why we don't know about it, unless you're working with it day to day, is that did anybody ever hear about a disability tax credit in school? Raise your hand if you heard about this in school. What? Don't we? Um, raise your hand if you heard about this credit when you got a job the first time. One. Okay. Raise your hand if you ever accompanied a parent to an emergency room and an emergency room physician told you about this credit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm blown away. Not really. Um, and so this is the this is the reason why that we don't know about this is because it's not talked about. One last question I want to ask you is: Raise your hand if you've ever gone to knock on the doorstep of CRA to ask them to tell you about all the credits and benefits that you're eligible for <laughs> and how you might access them. Good luck getting in touch with CRA. <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to wait eight hours, perhaps. Not get exactly, it and that's and that's one of the problems, and, and I'll highlight that in a moment. Next slide. So, what do we do? Are there any negatives to this credit? Is it worth it? What is it? All of these questions. How do I apply? I'm going to debunk some of that today. What is the disability tax credit? Well, it is a non-refundable tax credit. It does not mean the government says you have a disability. Here's some cash. It says, if you're a Canadian with a disability and you have taxable income, we're gonna reduce the amount of taxes that you have to pay because you get a non-refundable credit. So it means that you're not paying taxes on a higher threshold. So if your minimum tax rate was you know, 15,000, it's giving you a bump up to like 22, 23,000 before you have to start paying tax. So hopefully that is explains that piece. It's administered and approved by the Canada Revenue Agency, which is again another problem because these people are tax people. They are not medical practitioners and they've not been trained as such. And the reason that this causes so many complications for people is that CRA has been trained, the representatives at CRA have been trained to approve specific phrases. I went back to how many people heard about this credit in school. Do you know that no physician in this country ever learned about this credit in school either? And similarly, nobody from CRA ever showed up at their office to say, so Dr. Smith, remember that we at CRA are tax people and we don't understand medical language so in writing this, this is how we need you to write it in order for us to approve it. So none of these things are happening. It is based on newer criteria. They change the criteria, they don't tell people they change the criteria, but they do change it from time to time. And the credit that you have is potentially transferable. It can be transferred to other family members, and a lot of people don't understand that either. Next slide. So how is it going to benefit you? And I, ha I know I have a client there. I was having a hard time changing this slide and keeping the, the flushing toilet money. And I have to apologize, that's American money and not Canadian. I could not find a toilet flushing Canadian money. Um, so this 
is a tax refund. You can go back up to 10 years with this credit. If you leave this room today and you say, man, I've got a disability and I've had it one, two, three, four, ten 10 years back, you can then apply retroactively up to 10 years and get a big retroactive income tax refund. It lowers your tax burden in any of those 10 years backwards and in every year going forwards. Unless CRA tells you you need to reapply, which they do with some people, have to reapply every five years. We don't see that happening as much in the over 55 crowd. Um, I have my reasons for thinking why the CRA is doing that, but to delve into that, I would have to tell you about all of my thinkings about the discounts of the government, and I don't want to do that here today. This also, this program is like Pandora's box. Think of it as the credit that when you open the door, that you see all kinds of other doors and credits and, and celebrations out there, things that you can access. But we don't, we have a hard time getting through this door and knowing what, how to get through this door to know that all the other doors exist. Next slide. So to become eligible for this credit, it doesn't matter, next slide, how young you are. We have clients who are babies. We have clients who are uh, well into their hundreds. So it does not matter for this credit what your age is. Next slide. Similarly, it doesn't matter how old you are. <laughs> right? See, it doesn't care if you're 50, 80, 105. As long as you qualify for this, it doesn't matter your age. Excellent. Also, it doesn't matter whether you work or not. There's a misconception around this. People say, I'm not going to get this credit at work. No. You can get this credit even if you do work. Excellent. Also, it doesn't matter how much you earn. Some people on this credit earn very little. Some people are six-figure earners. Some people are seven-figure earners. It doesn't matter how much you earn. It's all predicated on what is the impairment you have and how does that impairment affect your everyday life. Anybody can apply. All you have to do is have a medical condition, an impairment, if I go back to that. Um, your symptoms have to be present for at least 12 months or be expected to be present for at least 12 months or more. Your symptoms have to generally affect you about 90% of the time. 90% of the time doesn't necessarily mean 90% of every day. It could be nine out of 10 times, nine out of 10 days. It could be nine out of 10 times. There's a lot of different ways of thinking about 90%, and it doesn't just mean 90% of any one day. And again, not to forget that that credit can be transferred and that becomes really important in a, in a moment. Next slide. So the areas of impairment here are physical impairments, which not a lot of us can see the physical impairments, uh, mental functions impairments. We also have life-sustaining therapy and cumulative effects, which means in cumulative effects, it means you don't have an impairment great enough in one area to qualify for the credit, but by combining two impairments, it might get you to the point where you can be approved for the credit. Next slide. Vision and hearing. These are probably two of the hardest credits to get, and that is because in vision, you have to essentially be pretty much unable to see. If, if we look at the actual criteria, and I don't know that many people know, but you know, 2020, is regular vision, your vision has to be 2200 um, in order for you to be qualified for this, and it has to be in both eyes. And you're judged with your glasses on, not them off. Or your field of vision has to be less than 20 degrees. Basically, if you look at that chart in your eye doctor's office and you can't see the top E, Hearing, again, your test specific, um, and it's judged on decibels. We won't get into the criteria, but essentially if you're bilaterally unable to hear 
someone known to you in a quiet setting, even with your hearing aids on, and you likely qualify. And that would actually, if you can't afford your hearing aids as well, um, then you could likely qualify. Because if you don't have hearing aids, you're judged with whatever you have in place. Next slide. Walking and eliminating. Walking. How many people can identify what 100 meters might be? Right away? These people who are really good at visual perception, it's great. Um, for those of us who aren't like me, um, my closer cut representation to 100 meters would be the length of a football field. If you cannot walk the length of a football field without stopping for one rest period, or it takes you three times longer than somebody your age with zero impairment. Think of the healthiest, insert your age, individual with no impairments and judge yourself walking that field against that person. Would it take you three times longer? Would you have to stop for a rest period? Could you not potentially be able to do that? And if that's the case, you qualify for the permit. Eliminating, this could be um, bowel or bladder. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be incontinence, that you have to be um, you know, wearing um, protective garments all the time. But it does mean that it's taking you a little bit longer than someone in your age again, without any impairments, to manage your bowel or bladder functions. And there's a whole bunch of impairments that can um, contribute to this kind of, uh, of uh, elimination uh, condition, which could be things like uh, incontinence, it could be stress incontinence, it could be urge incontinence, it could be uh, Crohn's, colitis, there's a number of different conditions that can contribute to having an elimination. And this is, I'm spending some time here because this is a hugely important thing to me personally. Incontinence is the leading cause of institutionalization among women. When you have incontinence, you're very likely to stop hydrating as well as you should. You're very likely to stop exercising as much as you should. And many people are so embarrassed about that condition that they don't ever even go talk to a physician about it. And what I would say to you is, if that is you, uh, you can put your hand up, but go and talk to somebody. Get some help with it. The credit is there. There are some treatments available out there for people, um, but you have to kind of go and get a diagnosis and get over the fear of telling somebody, hey, I have this. Because there's a lot of people that do. And the last thing I would want to see is somebody institutionalized because they didn't put up their hand and go and talk to somebody about it. Next slide. Dressing. Um, this, uh, a lot of people with strokes, a lot of people with um, rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis having trouble with their hands, doing up their buttons. Um, these are people that we find have difficulties with getting dressed. And it doesn't mean that you can't dress yourself. It means that you can't dress yourself in the same time as somebody else. It takes you three times longer. You need assistance or you can't. Um, same with speaking, and you're judged with speaking, so if I'm speaking to you in a quiet room, and you are, I'm, you're known, I'm known to you, and you can't hear me speaking, then in all likelihood, or you're having to ask me to repeat what I'm saying several times, then I'm likely to qualify with a speaking impairment. This does not include selective listening husbands out there. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Okay, feeding. It's comprised of two different areas. One is preparing food. So if you can't stand at the stove to prepare food long enough and you've got to sit down and take breaks, it's likely to qualify. And when we talk about preparing food, this is not about putting a microwavable meal inside of the microwave. This is, a, this is about making an actual meal from start to finish. Think about, let's call it meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and a salad. If you can't mash the meat and get it into the pan, if you can't peel and cut the potatoes 
and then mash them. If you can't wash the salad, dry the salad, spin the salad, put the ingredients in, chop all that's necessary, and put it all together, that's a meal, not one of these things you just throw into the microwave. So if somebody like that would qualify if, they, if it's taking them longer, they need to take breaks, or they simply can't do it at all. And eating food that people have had trouble with, saliva, they could have uh, esophageal conditions, <coughs> things like that, where it's taking them longer. They're, they're choking while they're eating, and so all of those things, remember, all of these impairments you're judging against somebody who's your age with no impairment whatsoever, is it taking you longer? Do you need assistance? And you're not doing it at all. Mental functions is a massive, massive area of impairment. It includes a lot of different conditions, and there's a lot of different criteria under mental functions that qualify things like goal setting, concentration, memory, perception of reality. To name a few, I'm not gonna catch them all if I try to run them all off one, one by one. But mental functions does uh, encompass a lot of different areas. Adaptive functioning would be another one. So dimensions, those things could be included here. Um, ADHD, we see ADHD quite often. We see a lot of adults being diagnosed with ADHD. The reason for that is that there's a lot more awareness around ADHD today, and children are being diagnosed with ADHD. There's another stat I'm gonna throw at you. What is the likelihood of a child with ADHD having a one parent with ADHD? Anybody want to take a wild guess at what that percentage might be? 50. Higher. 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 90. 90. For one parent? 90%. So what we're seeing is a child goes and gets an ADHD diagnosis. Parents hear from the, the practitioner. Well, likely Johnny got this from one of you. And so they go get tested. They find out which one of them typically it was. And then they look at me and say, it all makes sense. Why my report card said they didn't pay attention? Why they told me all these things all my life? It all makes sense. Why I had trouble getting all my paperwork together for my taxes? Why I, you know, why I, why I, why I? And and so we see a lot of adults now being diagnosed with ADHD. Life sustaining therapies. This is not type two diabetes unless you are on several injections of insulin per day. But it is type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is automatic approval nowadays. This was a change made at CRA two years ago. And now they're, they're automatically approving all type 1 diabetics from 2021 going forward. So if you have type 1, go ahead and apply. You're going to be automatically approved. If you want to go back further than that, you do have to pass the, the test, the CRA SNF test of it takes me 14 hours a week or more to manage my condition, and that can include a lot of different criteria, um, things like uh, preparing your, your, your skin for injection, and then it's, it's all the other things that come along with it. It's not traveling to and from appointments, but there's a number of different things. Life-sustaining therapies could be other things, such as dialysis. It could be chest physiotherapy or cystic fibrosis. There's a number of different life sustaining therapies that might qualify. Excellent. And I did mention cumulative effects. So if you don't have one impairment that is significant enough, generally 90% of the time or more, you could combine two impairments or three impairments together and have enough of an impairment at that point to get you over the hurdle with CRA to get approved. That's an excellent. Common conditions, arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, dementia, COPD. Does anybody know what COPD is? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. What is the condition or what is the impairment area you think people would qualify when you think lungs? Walking. Walking, yeah. So COPD equates to walking. Um, and then these mental functions, one. Before we go on to the issues, because I just spewed a lot of content at you, we talked a lot about the impairment areas. 
Does anybody have any questions about the qualification criteria? Okay, I'm just gonna start at the front and make my way to the back, and then I'm gonna do this. On our income tax forms, there is a federal tax credit and there is a provincial tax credit. Those two numbers are different. Um, how do they arrive at those two numbers? Because when I applied here a number of years ago now, it was much less than that. And how is that progression established? So the question was, when it comes to the tax credit, um, it's actually a tax credit in two separate areas. One is a federal, one is a provincial. And the amounts seem to go up, correct. So the amounts of the credits are continually being adjusted on an upwards basis. There is a federal tax credit that everybody is eligible for, and then there's a provincial tax credit and that is all set, set by um, legislation and provincial uh, bodies uh, along with federal bodies. And I can tell you that they're in a far better position than we are here in Ontario. In Alberta, they get a way bigger credit than we get here. It's almost double. Um, so it's all set by, uh, by legislation and for each province each, and, and by the federal government. So dollars are not dependent on this. The dollars are not dependent on the disability that you have. As long as you have the credit, you're eligible for those disability amounts that are available provincially and federally. Even, yeah. Even though you don't have a disability claim, that's up to the accountant to figure that out, right? I think if you tell him, I have a disability, the doctor does not, then he has to apply that. So if you have a disability that qualifies, this is when you have to go and make an application yeah. with the disability tax credit application process, which is called a T2201, T2201, the Disability Tax Credit Application. By the way, that form used to be five pages, it's now 16. Yeah. They changed it two years ago. I can tell you there's a lot of doctors who were not very happy about that. Can we go back to that whole thing I told you about before where doctors never learned anything about this credit? They also, and they weren't taught how to, to fill it out properly, so they're not chomping at the bed when you go in there this morning and go, yeah, let me fill that out, right? And they don't know how to fill them out successfully. And I'll tell you, I just dealt with uh, a woman who, whose husband actually was part of the OMA many years ago. And her doctor said to her, please don't go, oh my gosh. I know that this stuff happens every single day. Her doctor said, you're 88. People lose their mobility. People wear diapers. This is just part of aging. I'm not signing the form for you. Oh, Did I want to go raise them? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Will we help her? Yes. <laughs> but this is these are things that you're likely to hear. We have a gentleman who was amputated halfway by his head. He went into his doctor and said, Will you sign my tax credit? And the doctor said, Well, you got dressed okay to get in here today. You can't be disabled. Very common. Doctors do not generally want to fill it out because they never taught how, and it's time consuming. If a doctor was going to fill it out from start to finish, many times the process takes them 30 to 45 minutes. Do you want to take a wild guess at how long they have for appointments? About oh, 10 minutes, but they have a book, so five. Why does it say that on your income tax forms that if you they can apply for that at age 51, if you have a child that stems or has a disability of some sort, can they not apply? Yes, so anybody can apply. I think what you're talking about is the Registered Disability Savings Plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the federal tax I'll have to take a look at that one. Sure there, there is, there's criteria inside of, when we go into the other credits and benefits that are available to people, for people under the age of um, 49 or, or under, they have access to additional um, product called a, a registered disability savings plan that allows them to put money in and the government matches with money. Um, but yeah, there is no there is no limitation on, on your age when it comes to this credit. Okay, the next question going along. Who else had a hand up? There. With what expanding um, disabilities like Parkinson's where the research about the ability to five years ago 
Okay, so the question, if I'm understanding it correct, let me know if I'm hearing you correctly. The question was around Parkinson's. What happens, somebody has had Parkinson's for five years, are they able to go back the five years and apply for the credit based on the fact that they were impaired five years ago? Is that your question? Correct. 100%, yes. If it's within the 10 year period, you can always go back. As long as you meet the criteria test, you can go back to that five year period, or about the 10 year period and apply. So you would go back um, the full five years and get your doctor. So there's a place on the actual credit that says in what year did this impairment become severe enough to qualify and the doctor would put in you know, a date that is uh, 2018, five years? And then there would be your, your accountant or someone who does your you know, taxes, they can adjust your taxes going back the full five. If when you're working, you never disclose your impairment to your employer, um, is there a conflict? If you haven't disclosed it to your employer, will that work adversely to your application? Absolutely not. So the question was, if I qualify for the credit and I do not disclose my impairment, my, my um, positive uh, disability tax credit application that I have, that I've already been approved for, if I don't disclose that to my employer, does that negatively impact me in any way? The answer to that is no. And the only difference between telling an employer that you have a disability tax credit and not is that you fill out tax forms when you when you get a job and periodically they ask you to update that that might be on an annual basis. If you have the disability tax credit, it means they're gonna they're gonna reduce the amount of tax taken off of each paycheck because they know you have the credit, so they'll reduce the amount of taxes that they're taking off. If you say nothing to them, and I know a lot of people will say nothing because there is still some prejudice out there, it just means that at the end of the year when you do your taxes, even though your employer has no idea, you're just gonna get a refund um, of taxes paid at the end of the year based on the credit amounts that are available to you. Make sense? You have to have a doctor fill out the forms, is the question. And uh, the answer to that question is uh, not necessarily a doctor, okay? There are different individuals, different medical practitioners can sign off on different impairments. A medical doctor, a nurse practitioner can sign off on any impairment. An audiologist can sign off on hearing. A speech language pathologist can sign off on speaking. Um, an occupational therapist can sign off on walking, dressing, feeding. A physiotherapist can walk, sign off on walking. A psychologist can sign off on mental functions. There's a whole list of these. I've got some resources I can share with you about who can who can sign off on different impairments. I put together. Um, the disability tax credit criteria and common conditions. I've put together lists of who can sign off on which impairments. And I would tell you that uh, we're going to get into this a little bit, but there's a lot of a lot of physicians just say, "Oh, I, you're not going to get this. You're not going to qualify. I'm not going to sign it." Um, and I would say, if that's what you're hearing, then have a conversation with someone who might know this a little bit better than a doctor. Um, and if the doctors don't sign off on it, I can tell you as well that um, one of the big reasons we developed benefits too was because of all of these people that came to us and said, this is the experience I have with my physician. We are co-founded by a doctor in Canada who is a huge disability advocate who said, um, it is not fair for Canadians that either don't have a practitioner and there's about 40% of Canadians without a family doctor um, or those that don't have an advocate position to be left in the, in the cold on this thing. And so he is very, very uh, adamant on the fact that we bring in more physicians to be able to certify applications. So if you don't have a, an advocate position, um, I always reject you. Next. I've heard some of these practitioners are obligated to sign off on the Parkinson's 
I can't speak from the doctor's perspective. I do know that there are certain circumstances where a physician does have to notify uh, the Ministry of Transportation. I think it, it's sight related and maybe some other impairments as well, dementias perhaps, where they do have to let the, the Ministry of Transportation know. But as far as what those criteria are, I, I couldn't speak to that. Can you go back to the previous slide that you had up there? I, I didn't get a good look at it. Where it listed different. Um, this one? Yeah, yeah. So are those different things that are eligible? The things that are listed there? These things might be eligible, yes, depending on degrees of severity. There's, this is not an exhaustive list. This is a very small, small amount. I mean, we've mapped over 200 plus diagnoses that are available for the tax credit. Okay. How long does it take um, after you apply before you go back to the post, post strike? Yeah. <laughs> post strike, we're seeing it's not uncommon for people to wait three to four months to hear back from CRA. Um, it looks like it's picking up a little bit, um, but there's no rhyme or reason either. I mean, you could submit your application. We've had people who approved in a week, and we've had other people wait months. And I don't, I, we've called, you know, it's, you, you can get through, they, they have all kinds of reasons. There's a tracker that if you're really good at going onto your MyCRA account, you can watch the tractor, tracker, and they tell you what your suggested uh, date is to hear back, and then sometimes they, Move the date forward even more. I, it's all over the place, so it's hard to answer that question with any degree of accuracy. Is the tax credit always a percentage, or is it a particular amount? So the question is: Is the tax credit a percentage, or is it a specific amount? It's a specific amount. When you get the disability tax credit, there's an amount that you're entitled to federally, an amount you're entitled to provincially, that reduces the amount of taxes that you are owing them to CRA. And like I said, it varies by province, um, Alberta being the highest, I don't know where we are in the mix in Ontario. Um, but on average, I would say, you know, for most people in, the, in, a, in an average income scenario, they would see about uh, $1,500 here in Ontario coming back per year. Okay, I'll back to you in a second. Over here, I've got uh, a gentleman in a plaid shirt and then the woman in the blue shirt beside you. Go ahead. Uh, er earlier you described mental functions, memory concentration, uh, but then you said a, a word, I, I think you said adaptive function, and I wonder if, if that's right and what that is. Adaptive functioning, yes, it's, uh, or executive functioning is your ability to, um, to work through issues on your own, um, to be able to, to see a problem through, through its full, full uh, fruition of, of solving that problem. Um, I'll give you an example of this. My, my dad with his dementia has a really hard time with executive functioning, so he has a hard time seeing a solution, finding a solution, and so he defers that to many other people, and oftentimes, you know, if, if you asked him to count out money, he would probably try and count that out, he would might come to a different number, and then he would just get completely frustrated and throw it all over the place. Executive functioning. People that can't see through the consequences of an action would have um, impaired adaptive functioning. Has a lot, there's a lot of different areas for adaptive functioning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And, sorry, you're next. Okay, in a situation probably like you're in a situation, um, you have multiple people in the family with, um, that qualify for this deduction. How, when you do your taxes, how do they, they don't need the deduction, so you have, you can put two people's deductions on your income tax? Okay, so what you're talking about, Shish, the question was, if you have multiple family members and those family members are in lower income tax brackets and they can't utilize this credit, think about somebody who has a child with a disability and the child has never worked. 
and they might be on ODSP, which is the Ontario Disability Support Program. They have no taxable income. That credit can be transferred to a qualifying family member. It is a family member. There's a very strict criteria about who qualifies as family member. It's parent, um, spouse, grandparent, aunt, uncle, mother, sister, there's a number of different people um, that can qualify for that. But as long as you are on a regular basis providing food, shelter, or clothing, and that can be money towards those things too, even if you take the individual out for dinner once a week, you have them over for dinner once a week. These are all things that can show um, that you're providing one of those three necessities of life, and for that, you can then transfer the credit. So if you transfer the credit to a family member who has taxable income, it can reduce the amount of tax that they have to pay. I look after, right now, I have three, three, two, two credits coming to me. So my daughter is in a position where she's a PSW, but she's finding it very challenging to work the number of hours required <laughs> to, be, to be fulfilling her uh, her own status of life, I guess you would call, um, with the two disabled little ones that she has. So all of them live with me, and they, they transfer the credit to me. They don't have to be living with me. They could be living elsewhere, and they were for a while, and I was helping to support from far, and it's just easier now for me to help support while they're living with me. Does that all make sense? And typically, I like in a situation of spouse as well, that includes spouse, so if your spouse is is disabled and they're not working and earning enough income, that the, 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 the credit can be transferred to the spouse who can then claim the credit on their behalf. I'm going to come back to you in one sec for a second question. Who was the next person that had a question here? Okay, one there and then, so I'm going to go to you in the back first. So for a child that was diagnosed when they were three, four years old with ADHD, who is now early 30s, they need to have a reassessment by an educational psychologist to be able to have this, uh, apply for this? Okay, so the question was, for a child who was uh, diagnosed with ADHD at the age of three that is now 30, would they have to go through a reassessment in order to apply for this credit? Not necessarily, no. As long as there's documentation from uh, psychologist or some sort of medical documentation, a doctor, maybe they were on medications for ADHD, as long as there's something to substantiate that they were diagnosed with ADHD at some point, you can apply retroactively, apply the credit. Um, don't forget about applying for an RDSP. The government will give people money without them even putting any other funds in. We'll get to that in a second. I'd like to take a note because we're in a group of uh, 55 plus, which the RDSP doesn't make sense for somebody who it's not even available um, for somebody who's over 55. You can still put money in up to 59, but you won't get any government matching. It's only up to 49. Um, but it is incredibly powerful, this program. I will tell you, it is Canada's best kept secret. It was brought in, Minister Flaherty many years ago brought this this disability, this registered disability savings plan in. Where he, he and Christine Elliott have a disabled son. He was very much behind getting this, uh, this savings plan up and running. And for people who qualify for the disability tax credit, if they're under the age of 49, even if they put nothing in, they open this up, the government will put some money in. But it's when you put money in, the government matches that money that you put in on a one for, two for, or three for one basis. It's not uncommon to see families put in $3,500 the government matches that with 10,500. Because they're trying to give individuals with disabilities a way of saving a nest egg for retirement. So they, you only start to pull the money out of this registered disability savings plan when you're 60 and older, and there are set withdrawal amounts that you can take out, and that's what it's designed for. Talk to any parent who's got a child with a disability the biggest fear for them is what happens when they're not here. And so the government was trying to help them put a program in place that would give that child a bit of a nest egg and monies that didn't count against their other provincial benefits so that they could live a better, a better life. 
follow up to that question, yeah. Morgan? Do, so do you have something that I could come to you separately as far as just the details sure. for how you apply for that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, back up here. Oh, um, I just want to mention that I have applied for this number of years, so I was successful, and that's, that's good. I have a friend who has just applied recently with the same disability over the same period of time to qualify for the seat. Here. Can you see the surprise in my face? Can you repeat that? Can you repeat it? Can you repeat it? So what this, the question was, I applied for the disability tax credit years ago and was approved. I have a friend who recently applied for the disability tax credit with the same condition as me and she was approved. Why? So again, no surprise in this at all. I wonder if I should disclose this here. Okay, so CRA has a mandate to deny a certain percentage. I'm not going to talk about what the percentage is. They have a mandate to deny a certain number of applications per year. If this is surprising to you, I'll, I'll talk to you later. But um, these things exist. I mean, the government is not chomping at the bit to give you money. Right? And so it's quite common to have one person qualifying, one person not, and it depends on how that application was written. Right? If your application was written well with your condition, and then we have somebody else's doctor, same condition, but they didn't write the words that CRA needs to see to approve, they go back to like the OJ trial. If the glove doesn't fit, you've got to acquit. I mean, it's the same thing. If the, if the wording doesn't fit, deny. They're not medical practitioners. They have no idea. If, they, if the wording is not there, if it's ambiguous, if it doesn't say exactly what they need to see, not. Absolutely. The question was, can you reapply? Yes. Can you appeal a denial? Yes. Okay, answer that. Okay. If you have someone in long-term care, can you, can they reapply for any long-term care? Okay. The question was, if you have a family member in long-term care, can you apply on their behalf? So this goes to applying for somebody who may not have the mental capacity to apply for themselves. The power of attorney can absolutely apply on their behalf and they're still eligible to go back for the 10 years as well. And this credit is also available posthumously. Does anybody understand what posthumously means? Mm -hmm. Right. So as an executor, every executor in here should know that it's their, it's their duty to maximize the value of an estate for the beneficiaries. If that deceased individual qualified, they should be going back and retroactively applying, applying to CRA for the credit. Surprise faces in here. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, do other mental illnesses apply, like bipolar, anxiety, things like that? Absolutely. Bipolar uh, would, uh, would would normally qualify, injury severity again, um, schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, PTSD, probably three of the most common mental functions uh, applications that we see. PTSD, uh, military and um, first responders, police, ambulance, we do a lot of applications. I just did one for a police officer age 40 in Hamilton who will never return to his job. The things that people will tell you are shocking, um, and it's no wonder um, that they can't return to their jobs with what they see. Um, it does affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. And so there's so many people that can that kind of apply. These are childhood traumas too, people who have trauma in childhood years and years ago and have not dealt with it, and it can, it can manifest into some of these other conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to look at our CRA account, and uh, it says just get on your account and do the password and pick the account to apply for the disability uh, credit. We haven't done it yet. 
So that is new <laughs> this year. The uh, government brought out a way of you going onto your MyCRA account, completing part A of the application, and then it notifies your doctor to fill out part B. So if your doctor is competent and knows how to fill out part B well, um, then go ahead and do that. If they're not competent, if they've never had any training with this credit, um, you might want to apply in a different, in a different way. And they still accept, they still accept the other applications. Uh, we've developed, um, I'll go back to that in a second, then. I'll, I'll, cause we're gonna touch on that in just one second, so I'll go back to that. Just give me a second on that one. Anybody else have any questions about impairments? Over here. What about these companies that apply, would you pay the money for? Because my daughter did a going macro when she was turned down through the doctors. <clears throat> okay. The original paperwork. Okay, so you just led me into, <laughs> what I was going to say. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, my own struggle with this was my daughter had, I, I, I had self-identified uh, her issues very early in age. She was only four and I, I recognized that she was not learning in the same way as other children. She was having trouble with loops on letters. There was all kinds of warning signals that said something's not right and then the paying attention and it was a lot of issues. Um, she had assessments done at six, again at 12, again at 18. I kept getting these assessments. I kept asking, you know, at a certain point, it's them who has to go to the doctor and advocate for themselves. And the doctor kept saying, well, you're not going to qualify. Well, of course, you think she's not going to qualify because you don't see the manifestation of behaviors that I see. Because in your office in five, 10 minutes, she's not going to go zero to 60. She does that at home. <laughs> right? So I see all these things. You as a medical practitioner would see none of that. She's not gonna show you that. You're not following her around, you're not seeing her throw her shoes at the bus because she missed it, right? None of these things are happening, you don't see any of this. So it was very frustrating for me to be able to get her approved for this credit because I kept saying to her, let's go back to the doctor, let's get this applied for, when I realized that, yeah, she's not qualified, it's no problem. But by then it was her who had to advocate it, and she doesn't like to be labeled either. Um, so she was not really good at advocating for herself. So, like your friend, I took to going to one of these companies that's a promoter company. They're called promoters. Disability Tax Credit Promoters. And what they do is they help you with the application process. In turn, they take a percentage of your refund. 20, 25, 30, 40% of your refund. And thousands of dollars sometimes. But I was successful. And it was that experience and that day back in December of December, January, December 2020, January 2021, when I finally got the approval and I was like my happy dance. And then my sad dance when I looked at the bill and I went, not on my watch. No way. I'm in a I'm gonna build something that makes this easier for every Canadian that comes after me. They'll never again have to give out percentages of refunds like that for assistance if you're struggling. The government did bring in legislation in 2021, November 15, 2021, the government brought in the Disability Tax Credit Promoters Restrictions Act. Um, the, the difficulty was that one of these promoter companies that takes 30% of people's refunds, sought an interlocutory injunction against the government saying, hey, wait a second, you're federal government, we're regulated provincially, you can't, you can't fix our fee at $100, which is what they wanted to do, was fix it at $100. And they won against the government on the basis that, yeah, that's a technicality, okay, so we're federal government, we can't fix fees of people who are regulated provincially. And they've never figured out a way to get the the legislation be able to be applied. Um, it's there, they just can't kind of apply it. Shopping? That's it for questions for now? Where are we at here? I'm going to go Yeah. Come on. Only got half hour. I think the next the rest part of this uh, presentation will go pretty quickly. So, what are the issues, right? That's one of the issues. Like, we have a lot of people who don't understand this. We have 
Dr. Christians don't understand it, so let's move on. which really sent a lot of other areas, uh, people with impairments, into a tizzy. They're like, how can, you, how can you automatically approve one group and not others? I mean, how would be ticked off of that, too? But it's just the way that CRA tends to, to operate. Next slide. We talked about this. Unsure medical practitioners. I could, t I could sit here until the end of day today and beyond and tell you about all of the stories about physicians telling people that they will not qualify for this. It's their perception that you have to be severely disabled. You have to be in a wheelchair and not be able to push it yourself to get this right. Totally incorrect. Incorrect. They're giving out incorrect information. I get why. They probably don't want to fill out the form because it's complex, it's time consuming. And this is the reason why we developed what we developed was to try and make it. If somebody came through our application process that we developed, you would get an application that is written for success, the CRA, that any medical practitioner could review, print, sign, in five minutes or less, as opposed to taking 30 to 45 minutes to fill it out and maybe even not successfully. The reason why we do this. Okay, and we have a doctor who's a co-founder on our team, so. Um, confused and mis misinformed people, so we have Hey, my neighbor has cancer and gets the credit. I have cancer too. Why am I not getting the credit? It all comes, it is not condition specific. It all comes down to what impairment do you have? How does it affect you 90% of the time in your everyday living? I might have cancer, but it may not affect my my day-to-day -day living activities 90% of the time. But my neighbor may have cancer that does affect. So we can't go by just condition. It is how does it affect your activities of daily living? and it has to be present about 90% of the time. Do you have to tell your employer, if you don't want them to know, we already addressed this question, thanks to this gentleman over here, but no, you don't have to tell your employer anything. You can get this credit, have it on your account, and not tell anyone. We don't walk around with these labels that say, I have this, I have that, right? If you're afraid of being labeled, it's not, it's not that way. Uh, you're talking about Canada Pension Plan Disability? Yeah, if you apply for that, or does it automatically uh, Yeah. You apply for <laughs> if you apply for CPPD, Canada Pension Plan Disability, do you automatically get approved for this? No, you have to apply for this one too. None of them are like that. Just because you apply for one doesn't mean you get the other one. You have to apply for whatever, uh, whatever you're eligible for. Okay. So I'll be labeled again, this whole thing is, we, no, nobody here has to wear a label, right? Many of those disabilities are invisible, you don't have to tell anybody who don't want to. Are there any negatives? No. There are no negatives to applying for this. Unless you're applying to the wrong way and you get, you get denied, and that, maybe that's a negative for you, but there's, it's not without remedy, if we put it that way. Is it worth it? Absolutely it's worth it. Next slide. Uh, I took that slide out, but I did in the previous presentations, I've given a bit of the synopsis of some of the people that we've helped get the credit and the range of monies that they've gotten back. Um, it does vary quite substantially depending on the amount of income tax that you pay. We've had people get back tens of thousands of dollars. We've had people get back very small refunds. I just saw a family with two disabled children out of Alberta get back $80,000. credit in Alberta, but it, make no mistake, it's, it can be very worth it. So what are the benefits to you? It's the retroactive refund that you're eligible for. It could be future tax relief, obviously, if you're approved from now till, uh, they call it at CRA in, indefinite. You get an indefinite approval, that means you're approved from now, or whatever, whatever going back, the retroactive amount, through indefinitely, which means you can apply this credit from now until you're your death. 
Um, it does open up access to lots of other credits and benefits and supplements. If I gave you the full list here today, and then we could be here until tomorrow discussing all of the different things, I'm going to give you a listing of some of them that are probably relevant to many of you in the room, especially when it comes to aging in place. Uh, again, the Registered Disability Savings Plan, that is the one for uh, children uh, under the age of 49, where the government will match those. There's, there's two portions of it. Um, they'll match the grants and bonds, um, and they'll get money even to those accounts without you putting any money in. But if you put money in, it's a, uh, there's a matching program up to 49. Between 49 and 59, you can still put money in. The government won't match it. And then after that, the program is done. You have to start drawing by age 60. There's a whole bunch of rules and regulations around RDSPs and I'm not going to get into that. I'm not a financial advisor, by the way. Next slide. The Canada Caregiver Credit. So if you uh, have a qualifying family member and you, you are approved for the disability tax credit, uh, your caregiver um, can apply for the caregiver, the Canada Caregiver Credit um, as well. So there's a whole, there's another, there's another credit for the person who is providing care for you as well. And there's a whole set of criteria about who's eligible. Um, and, and whatnot. So we won't, we'll get into all of that at the moment, but just know that there is that credit there, um, and it is available for someone who's a caregiver. Medical expenses and disability support deductions. Again, if you have a disability tax credit, you can claim certain medical expenses. There's a whole list of them on CRA's website. If anybody's interested, you can probably reach out to me, and I can probably pick them off and put them in a document and send them to you. The home accessibility renovation expenses. If you have a disability tax credit and you renovate your home to make it more accessible for you, you can actually claim this credit up to a maximum of, uh, is it? Uh, yes, it was, it was 10, it is now 20,000, so you can get up to $20,000 and the credit will give you a possible $3,000 coming back to you if you've made that home more accessible for you. Next one, brand new this year. The multi-generational home renovation tax credit is to allow for family members to either buy a new home and, and, rent it, and have it renovated so they can accommodate a family member moving in with them, or to take their existing property and, and um, renovate it so it accommodates uh, a senior family member moving in with them or moving on to their, their property with them. Uh, Education-related benefits, there are a lot of education-related benefits, and actually, I think Benefits 2 is going to do a whole ADHD seminar on uh, what's available for people with disabilities to apply for education, um, because the, the government has a lot of grants available for those individuals as well, and a lot of parents want to know about that, parents, grandparents, um, the like. So there's a whole list of those things, I won't get into all of them today. Well, that's it. Time here is uh, all of them. <laughs> but if anybody has any questions that they don't mind asking, and they are a benefit to everybody else here, your questions are probably something somebody else is sitting there thinking, but they'd be too afraid to sit up their hand and ask. So those things are very helpful. Go ahead. The, um, where do you apply for the form online? The actual, where is the application form? So if you, if you just go on to um, a search and, and type in um, the Disability Tax Credit, Disability Tax Credit Canada or Canadian Disability Tax Credit, it should come up. There's, there's a couple of different uh, ways to look at those forms through CRAs like the Government of Canada's website. Um, and if you're in your My CRA account, like I said, you can fill out Part A, but it's up to the doctor then to fill out Part B. I've heard some doctors say they're not, they're not interested in going online and filling out online. I've had other doctors say, yeah, go ahead and submit it and I'll fill it out online. Um, the way that we do it is we have a nine question assessment. It is free of charge for all of you to use, okay? Um, it's found at um, www.dtc, that's disability tax credit, dtc.benefits2, and that's the number two, dot ca. There, it's a nine question questionnaire. It takes you approximately two to three minutes to fill it out. And at the end of that questionnaire, you would, um, you would know whether or not you're likely to fall there or not. Can you say that website one more time? Absolutely. So it's www.dtc, 
disability tax credit, DTC dot benefits, B-N-E-F-I-T-S, and the number two dot C-A. Canada 
um, to be able to successfully know enough about this credit to be able to have these conversations and then we're also there to support them all along the way. Many of them have disabilities as well um, because I believe, like I say, if you have this credit, you know about this credit more than other people would and you're probably a, a really good person to help guide somebody else through the credits so we're also doing you know, it's, it's a two-part two approach. We're helping somebody with a disability um, have an, an opportunity to have a job or career um, that works for them, that's accessible, they can do it more they want to. Um, we provide all the resources for them and then we have people having access to be able to work through with somebody. These people have gone through extensive training. We've been training them for the last several months. So that's available for anybody that wants to have a conversation. Um, and there's a bunch of people on my team as well and we've got medical practitioners who are on staff. If you don't have a medical practitioner, they can actually as long as they have your medical record to substantiate, they can review your application and, and certify for you. Anybody else have any questions? No, okay. Thanks very much, Christine. I don't know about you, but I've learned a ton of stuff. I didn't know a fraction of what you spoke about. Thank you so much. It was very informative. Um, so just before you go, I just wanted again to acknowledge our educational partners. They're all over here at the side. Do you take time to speak with them? Christine's going to hang around as well. If you have any questions for Christine, uh, also please do sign up if you if you'd like to attend our December session, the Wednesday, December thirteenth, same time, same place. It's in the spirit of the season. We're going to be talking about gifts. So what are what are our gifts? How do we discover them? How do we benefit from them? How do we share our gifts with others? And then just as well, if you're coming to that session, we ask that you bring a pair of socks or two with you, and we'll be donating all of that to the Health and Compassion Society here in Burlington for those in need. Um, so we'll have a little bit of fun and be a little bit more celebratory. If you're here, and if you're not receiving emails from me, and you'd like to, please do see Lisa and Rorita, uh, so we can do that. I do send out the video replays, and I do send out reminders for the upcoming sessions, so if you'd like to stay connected, uh, please do make sure that I have an email address or at least a phone number, some way to connect with you. Also, in the event that something happens in the last minute, I need to get in touch and say it's canceled, or we're good, or something's happened, I don't want people showing up and being disappointed. So we really do appreciate it if you just leave us your contact information. If you'd like to register for the next session as well, Lisa and Ian can help um, take your names down. Our sessions will continue in 2024, right here. Um, the first session is going to be on, remind me, uh, sorry, no, I take that back, healthcare. Everyone has been asking about more information about our healthcare and healthcare system, so we'll have somebody from, um, what are they called now? Sorry. That's the one. And uh, a home care provider and hopefully a, um, a care planner. Um, in February, it will be. Shoot, I forgot this. I told somebody else. Uh, February will be with asking a lawyer, a lawyer, accountant, and a financial advisor. In March will be 50, um, 55 plus home uh, housing options. And then in April we'll have something up our sleeve. Just not prepared to be able to share more about that yet. But next year we've got a full agenda. So hope to see you again. As you can see, we're going to be in this room for the balance of, for at least for the first half of next year. So it's important if you do plan to attend, that you get some registrations in because we're going to be at capacity soon. Okay, so anyways, thanks very much. Have a safe trip home.